Welcome to the Unrivaled Man Podcast. I truly am so grateful to have you here today. You are here on a wonderful, wonderful day. I have I have an amazing guest today. His name is Dr. Benjamin Hardy. So I'm going to give you a little bit on a little bit of his bio, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him. So Dr. Benjamin Hardy is an organizational psychologist, an author, and the world's leading expert on the application of the future self science. His books have sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and his blogs have been read by hundreds of millions. He and his wife, Lauren, are the parents of six kids, and they live in Orlando, Florida. Now, Ben is a truly amazing man. I, I, am, uh, I am currently uh, a member of Ben. It's called his, his, his Platinum Group, um, and it's it's his Accelerated Momentum Program, it's called. And it is, it is an amazing thing. I, I, I joined this program at the beginning of the year because I was wanting to take part of my life to, to kind of another level. And, and I'm telling you, uh, I was, I've, been, I've read things by Ben for, for, quite some time, for quite some time. And when he started offering this, a chance to be able to work with him and a very small group of people um, and just working on improving ourselves just really helping to become our future selves. Um, I, I jumped at the opportunity earlier this year, and I can tell you it's been transformational for me in, in my life. And so I'm so grateful to be able to have Ben here today because, because some of the things that, that he has helped me in my life have not only made me a better businessman and helped me in that side of my world, but it has helped me be a better husband, a better father, and just a better person in general, all by helping me get clear on who I really want to be. And so without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Benjamin Hardy. All right, Ben, we're on. Welcome to the Unrivaled Man podcast. Thanks for joining me. Clint, you are awesome. I like hanging out with you. I love talking to you. So this is going to be cool. Well, thank you. Well, I've, I appreciate it. Well, like, like I said in the introduction, we've, we've known each other for a little while now. Um, and, and it's been so much fun over, over the last, uh, really the first part of this year to be able to just really go deep with, with, with you and your platinum group. And, and honestly, it's been a lot of fun. So on the podcast, people have already heard a, a lot of, a lot of your influence. And so I'm excited to, to have you on here for everyone. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's, I'm all awesome. for it. Well, Ben, as we get started today, I mean, if, if you wouldn't mind as we, as we start, would you just tell me a little bit, let's just tell the audience a little bit about kind of your story, kind of how you, how you got here to, to do what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm going to do it in the reverse order that most people do it, um, just because it's kind of more, so there's a great quote, and I, I don't usually do this, but um, so there's a great quote from Steve Jobs. He said, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect the dots looking back, right? And so like one thing that I'm doing in a book I'm writing right now is I'm, I'm having people go from where they are now and looking at their previous growth stages from here. Mm -hmm. So I'll just kind of tell my story backwards from where I'm at right now, and that might be a little interesting. It, it might also it. not work. Um, <laughs> yeah, it might not work to do it in verbal format, but I'm just going to try it. So who I am right now is... Uh, I'm a husband and father of six kids. My kids are my older three, and we did adopt them um, kind of in our last chapter. Um, but we adopted them like, what was it now? It's been like four years from the foster system. Um, but yeah, so they are 11, 13, and 15. And then we got, we got two three-year-old twins that turned four soon, and then we got a one-year-old boy that turns two soon. So... Um, well, actually all of our kids pretty much have birthdays on the second half of the year. Um, but yeah, we live here in Orlando, Florida. I, I write books on self-development and also entrepreneurship. And so, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much who I am. I just do more and more of that. I'm always intrigued by, um, really, I guess, I guess I will say, since we already talked about it, like this book right here, Be Your Future Self Now, um, I'm interested in how to how to pretty much live the life you really want and how to how to do that powerfully and so those are the, those are some of the ideas I I write about in terms of kind of how I got here 
in the last chapter of my life, uh, I was doing my PhD in organizational psychology. I was doing that at Clemson University, and uh, that was from 2014 to 2019. And when I got to Clemson, when I first got there, I was not an entrepreneur, but I was very interested in entrepreneurship. And so I actually did research. When you when you when you work when you do a PhD program, what happens is is you sign up to work with a, someone who's an extreme expert in a topic that's interesting to you. And so I, there was someone who was at Clemson who was one of the top researchers in the world on psychological courage. She's been studying courage, like all the mechanics of courage, <laughs> for decades. And so I wanted to work with her and write about entrepreneurial courage. And so I did my master's thesis on, on, on that, studied the difference between wannabe entrepreneurs and real entrepreneurs. And then I ended up doing my dissertation uh, on a deep dive subject called transformational leadership theory. Um, and when we first got to Clemson, that was kind of the kickoff for me to finally start working towards my future self as a professional author. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it took five, it took several years. It actually took like three and a half years, um, to, you know, grow a massive audience and get a professional book deal and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I can see, I, did, what I, I just love that you did so much of that just because I know a little bit more of your story that you did so much yeah. of that and building your business and building your audience while you were doing your PhD right <laughs> and well the thing is is like yeah for me the PhD was kind of like a part time job but like if I woke up early I could like take online courses I could write blog posts I could like pick the brains of authors and like mm. you know it really doesn't take that long like I'd write one blog post like four times a week and that it, that was like two two hours in the morning you know and so I would just procrastinate my coursework my classwork and my classes I was not a very great student you know like I was learning but like I put my future self way before my current self so yeah I mean there's so many aspects of my story it's it's actually a little clunky trying to go backwards now that I'm doing it um so I'll just probably stop there but if there's any aspects of what you know about me that you think would be useful to the audience, I'm happy to share. Uh, or we can just go whatever direction you want to go, Clint, seriously. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things I think is is fun when you talk about from from your story, because I think I just saw, um, you know, you know, recently that you and your wife just had an anniversary, right? And and I literally just yesterday, was, literally like yesterday, yesterday, right? Our, yesterday was our 10 year anniversary. Yes, and and that's and that's what I love about what's what's so crazy about your story is is I also have six kids, um, but I've been married a little longer than you have, <laughs> and, and we got them all one at a time, and and I just think about um, about that story and about how we we have here on on the show so many of our listeners are our fathers, and they are ones fathers, husbands, and and business owners and business leaders. And I think about how, um, how you got thrown into that world so quickly. I mean, you went from no kids, just you and your wife, to three kids so quickly. And, and yet still managed to do all of these other things that your future self was going to accomplish. And you started doing it. And, and, and I know that that is something that would be, I think something the audience would, would really enjoy to hear yeah. is a little bit more about how you got through that because so many of people right now are probably listening saying, man, I'm in the middle of it with life, with kids. How do I go and accomplish this great dream that I have? Yeah, so one of the downsides of starting the story with your current self versus where you were and all the crazy trauma and crazy things that you went through to get here is it doesn't paint the best picture. Um, yes. but, uh, yeah, I guess what I will say is, is two things. One is I did grow up, um, you know, I, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Parents got divorced when I was 11. Both of them kind of went radically different ways and, you know, very interesting. My dad became an extreme drug addict. Um, it was just an interesting time. I had zero stability. Um, but luckily I was able to graduate uh, high school ended up serving a two-year church mission which was transformational and then really decided on that experience that I wanted to write books and study psychology um, so for the first four years I got home from that experience in 2010 um, was first four three and a half years was really um, learn psychology get a bachelor's like learn how to actually like be a student because I barely graduated high school 
Um, but once we got into the PhD program, and it took a few attempts to do that because um, I failed, you know, like I got rejected a lot. But we were trying to get pregnant, um, my wife and I. We were we wanted to have a family. We wanted to have kids. That was something that was super important. My wife had actually been married before before me. Before she met me, she was she got married really young, and she ended up being sadly in a really abusive marriage for three years, and then she got out of that situation luckily and then she ended up traveling the world trying to reinvent herself and then she ended up actually doing a church mission as well so i met her right when she got home from that and she was like ready to start having kids but we it was just kind of didn't happen um and so when we got to clemson we signed up to be foster parents and we just you know got got these three siblings and in terms of like how how I handled that and uh, how I handled that while trying to do a PhD while also like waking up at five in the morning so I could try my, try to grow my writing career. Um, I actually gave a Ted talk on this, but um, one thing that's really interesting is that I don't feel like I could have succeeded without those kids. It's kind of, it's kind of an, uh, a, a reverse way of looking at it. I really am believing more and more that they are my teacher more than I'm their teacher. Like, uh, they highlight all of my weaknesses. <laughs> Even when I think I've, like, outgrown something, boom. Like, yeah. I realize I have not outgrown this. And they they also give me the traction. Like, um, I feel like once we got those kids, I felt this massive weight of responsibility that, like, I really – I really need to like grow up and show up and figure mm-hmm. stuff out. And so they, without even knowing it, kind of lit a lot of fires under me and they've forced me and my wife to grow up really fast in a lot of different dimensions. And we've had them now for like seven or eight years. Um, but now they're like teenagers and we're, st- we're like, we gotta, we gotta figure this out fast. Cause not only are they teenagers, but they also do come with mm-hmm. other challenges. And so, um, I see myself as the ultimate beneficiary in the relationship. I see them as the teacher. Obviously, I still have plenty I can, you know, guide and help and support. And but yeah, I, I feel like I've just been massively blessed, honestly, and supported through through it. And um, yeah, I don't know if you have any like, if you want, you can drill down in any direction. I'm just kind of yeah. providing some thoughts. I really don't know yeah, how well, I got through it. You know what I mean? I'm serious. Like. Totally. Uh, well, what, it was what I think, it was overwhelming. A lot of depressing moments. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Well, do you know what I think of is you know a lot of times we talk about two two different things that that I know a lot of times I've I've heard you talk about is one is is kind of forcing functions right he so so big. so things that happen in our lives that really you know kind of not necessarily you know back us into a corner but they're things that kind of that that really start making us. You know, change. Having the three kids was a massive forcing function for me. Massive. Yeah. yeah, and but just so everyone knows, a forcing function is any situational factor that pushes you in a specific direction. Like, you know, like a deadline could be a forcing function for like really getting the job done. You know what I mean? Um, so there's there's forcing functions, but yeah, that one was big. Where it's like, oh, I now have these three kids. I got. I don't have any more time. Like, you know. If I if I didn't have them, I could have easily justified coming home and, you know, working at night or just sitting and watching TV. But it's like, no, I come home and the house is a mess. My wife's pulling her hair out and these kids are fighting and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, like, like I got to stop. I guess I, I I guess I can only work on this job thing like at 5 a.m. Because when I come home, my wife freaking needs me. And like, I got to actually get home fast. So, you know, it changes everything. And so. Yeah, it was it was intense, but a lot of uh, a lot of meaning, a lot of purpose, and uh, you know, a lot of prayer. <laughs> it's just Definitely. it's just it's a lot of things that a lot of things that help you through it. And uh, certainly, when we let when we got to Clemson in 2014, and when we left in 2000, we ac- we actually moved to Florida in 2018. But I finished my PhD in 2019. Uh, totally different shoes. You know, I was actually literally making $12,000 a year when we got to Clemson because I was a graduate research assistant. And when you start doing a PhD program, you get paid almost no money. You're pretty much just working so that you don't have to pay for tuition. Like they'll give you like a thousand bucks a year, but they, they just, they call it, they waive your tuition. And after my first year, I kind of made the leap where I was like, 
I'd rather pay my own tuition and try to build my 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 own writing career in my business because I just I valued my time too much. <laughs> and so yes. I kind of made that leap and just really went for it and took a totally different path than the other PhD students. See, I, I, I love that. So, so this whole, so once again, your, your new book is Be Your Future Self Now. And I love in your story just so many different parts where you've had these little pivotal moments in your life where, where you decided just that. You may not have had that exact language at the time, but that's what you were doing essentially, right, is determining hey, if, if I want to be my future self, might as well do it now, right? I don't need to do it the same way everyone else has done it <laughs> and, and make that happen. I, I love that. Um, you know, in, in the book, I love, I love one, of your, one of your chapters. It says, you know, it says your future drives your present, right? Your future drives your present. So as you think about, you know, your past, when, you know, what's, what's another time that really sticks out to you where, you know, where where you where you felt like your future really drove your present so i actually believe that's true in all situations people just often don't look at it through that lens so mm -hmm. let me give an example often often we think that the past is actually dictating who we are certainly our view of our past and our experiences can and our culture our friends etc can influence the expectations or the standards or the goals that we have. But at the end of the day, it's the goals that we have um, that force us forward. Even if in a lot of ways, your goal is just simply to get to work so that you can pay the bills. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing driving you. You know what I mean? Like you're on the hamster wheel if that's the case. Yes. But um, one good example was me as a young man. So like when my parents got divorced at age 11, I, I still had, I actually even at that point thought I wanted to go serve that church mission. Um, but we stopped going to church. We stopped um, really practicing it for years. But it was still like this idea in my mind. So how I look at it is Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. And one of the things he talks about in that book is that he pretty much says, when you have a why to live for, you can bear almost any how. What he means by that, and he breaks it down a lot in the book, and that book is really about the people who survived the Nazi concentration camps, like the Jewish people who were inmates and like had to go through the Holocaust. He was one of those people, and he was also a psychologist in there helping people to like oh, yeah. have hope and stuff like that, and he ended up surviving and wrote about his experience, and it's called Man's Search for Meaning. Incredible but one story. of the things that he talks about is that, like, he, he basically says that if you don't have a purpose for your future, your present has no meaning. And if your present has no meaning and you're not really working towards something specific that gives your life purpose and meaning, then as a person, you're kind of falling apart. He says you lose your spiritual hold. And so he, he found that when people lost hope in their future in the concentration camps, just the ridiculousness of the situation, mm -hmm. also being starved to death, it just became too unbearable, and they ultimately ended up dying very quickly. Like, and he could predict it. Mm -hmm. And so the only reason I share that is, is like, psychologically, and there's a lot of research now to back this up on, like, hope and things like that, like, and, and other topics, which if we want to, we could go into them. But mm -hmm. we are all determined or driven by the future that we most believe in, whether that's a, a hopeful future or a non-hopeful future. If you've got a pessimistic view of the future, that's going to definitely, like, impact who you're being right now you know mm -hmm. and so for me as that young man you know 13 14 going through high school because i had that view in my future you could call it a goal and that's the word that victor frankel used mm -hmm. uh, of getting on that mission even though there were times when like i was pretty sure i wasn't gonna go uh, it was still this this kind of goal and because it was kind of a goal it 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 helped me navigate like I knew, for example, that if I wanted to go on that mission, and I might change my mind, but I knew if I wanted to go, I'd probably have to graduate high school because from what I understood, you needed to be a high school graduate to go on those kind of things. And so, like, mm -hmm. because that was a goal, I'm like, okay, well, I'll keep going to school at least to bare minimum to graduate. So, like, that's an example of the goal shapes the process. I also, yeah. like, main maintained at least some degree of the standards just because I knew that there were standards, et cetera, to go on those things. And so... Uh, the reason I share that one 
and I could share any episode of my life, really, but like, you know, Frankel says, you know, if you don't have a goal or a purpose that that's giving you direction or or that you're striving for, you're going to kind of fall apart and the situation will overwhelm you. And my situation certainly was overwhelming. You know, like I had no stability. Uh, things were pretty rough, pretty chaotic, but I had some North Star that allowed me to some degree navigate it. And you could apply that same situation to the next chapter, like me, you know, when I get home from that experience, trying to get into like a various college or, or trying to get into grad school, right? Or once I get into grad school, trying to become a professional author, right? Or when we're trying to adopt our kids or now in my situation, whatever goals I'm pursuing now, like we're always being driven by what, what we're, what we're most committed to. And so, yeah. I, I like what you just said. We're being driven by what we're most committed to, you know, cause, cause what happens is, is, is sometimes I think we get so focused on even like time frames, right? Like we'll say, you know, someday I'll do X, you know, like someday I'll do that thing that I want to do. Right. And, and that's, and that's what I, that's what I love about uh, once you, once you get to a different level of commitment, instead of just saying someday, you're saying, I'm doing it right. Kind of that, uh, often well, if you you're, talk if about you're, like if you're still waiting commitment to a hundred percent commitment, yeah. what was that? I was just going to say, if you're, if you're still waiting, then you're not committed. What you're committed to oh, is yeah. whatever you're now doing. Like you can know what you're, you can know what you're committed to by, by observing your behavior. So like, mm-hmm. obviously we were both committed to having this conversation because here we are, you, there's no, yeah. the proofs in the pudding. And if anyone's listening to this, then you were committed to listening to it. Um, so you can know what you're committed to by watching what you do. Um, and and the truth is, is that there's a lot of things we want, but that we're never, that we never quite get committed to. Um, you know, we may want, you know, we may have wanted to start that business or write that book, or maybe we wanted to, you know, be at our kids' games, right? But like, we never actually made it a commitment. We never actually made it a non-negotiable. It just, it was just something we wanted, but ultimately we were committed to something else, as evidenced by what we did. And so the only way to actually quote unquote, be your future self now is to get committed to that, uh, to make that who you are, and then to let go of the things that are in direct contradiction to it. Um, one, one really good way of looking at this, and this is kind of how I see it, is just identity. Identity is who you are as a person, or it's at least what you're most committed to as a person. And so um, the only way to change, you know, to change what you're committed to is to simultaneously change your identity. You change who you are, how you show up, what you believe in, what you care about. And you prove that by, by like actually making it who you are and stopping the things that are opposite of that. You know, so, so I, I love the stopping part of it. You know, I mean, I, I know that, uh, sometimes at the beginning of the year, you know, you'll hear, hear different people talk about, you know, new year's resolutions. And some people will talk about doing like a, like a stop doing list, that kind of a thing. And so, so that's, so that's, that's a, that's a not a super new idea of saying, "Hey, we got to stop doing some things." But when you talk about stop doing things, it's a it's a different level. You, you know what I mean? Like like I know when some people like when I first stopped doing list philosophy. I mean, heck, I even talked about it on the podcast back in the day. Um, you know, finding some of these bad habits you want to stop doing, but there wasn't like a real purpose. It wasn't driven by a purpose, and in the filter that you were determining what to stop doing was more kind of generic when people talk about it. But, but, but take us through that a little bit further about the elimination of things to get you, you know, that, basically that future self filter. So I'll share with you two quotes to start. One is my favorite quote, which comes from Robert Brault. And he says, we're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. Mm. So lesser goals are anything that is easy in the moment, but is ultimately taking you away from what you really want, right? So if I want to be focused at work, I'm trying to write my book, but I keep getting on Facebook, right? Like that's some lesser goal. Like, um, and so we're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to lesser goals. And, and those lesser goals could be friends, honestly. They could be hobbies, bad habits. They could be, they could be your job, right? Your jobs become a lesser goal, but you're just holding on to it because you're, because it's convenient to do so. Um, it's got a clear path, right? Um, going towards your big goal might not have quite a clear path. 
you might have to find you might have to get onto a 500 pathways to finally figure out how to get there um yeah, which is more secure in some way right yeah it's 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 it, yeah how i look at it is the the lesser goals are your current self whereas what you really want is your future self um and that's that takes committing and what 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 it means when you commit is that you let go of the things that are stopping you from getting there you get rid of those lesser goals and so there's a second quote that is one of my favorite quotes as well and it it's basically perfection is not when there's nothing left to add but when there's nothing left to take away so when you want to go really big in some direction you can't go surface level you've got to actually commit to it to the point where you stop doing the 50 other things you're doing and actually say no this is what i'm serious about this is who i am this is where i'm going um I'll kind of go into this because I think it'd be useful, and I, I know you know the framework very well, but right now I'm writing a book called 10X is Easier Than 2X. And this whole book is really about um, you have the choice. You can either commit to something really, really exciting and also something extremely transformational, which would be what I'm calling 10X. Um, it's who you really want to be, and it's it's also so big that it almost feels impossible. It requires a lot of faith, commitment, courage, and ultimately you transforming to get it. There's a lot of excitement, um, also a lot of fear that you've got to overcome, and a lot of growth you're going to have to go through to make one of these kind of jumps. And there's frameworks, there's ideas for how to do it if, if you want to go through the learning process. 2X is more of the idea that you're just going to keep doing more of what you're already doing. Like... You're not really – you don't need to change that much. You just keep – you're just kind of plodding along. So you're kind of letting the past and the present dictate your strategy, whereas 10X as an idea is more about you choose the future that you want and you let that future dictate what you do. Mm. Well, just kind of going to the idea of elimination, one of the things that is kind of the core concept of this book is the 80-20 principle. And the 80-20 principle is the idea that – 80% of your results comes from 20% of what you do. Um, this same principle, you know, and it's not a new principle. It's actually a very perpetuous principle. Um, you know, 80% of money is made by the top 20, you know, by 20% of people, et cetera, um, even in, in all domains. And so it's, it's a true idea. But the idea is if you want to go for 10X or if you want to go for like some real transformation, then you've got to eliminate the 80% that's not worth your time. And so no matter how successful you are, no matter where you're at in life, you have that 80% that's lurking, that's just still there, that's your current habits, your current job, maybe your current roles, uh, your hobbies, whatever it is, there's that 80% of things that isn't worthy. And you, you, you brought it up earlier about the future self filter. Like mm -hmm. your big future self goal is a filter. And that 80% of things can't make it through that filter so as long as you keep those you can't be where you want to go you're still committed to lesser goals you're still committed to your current self so right. you've got to let that. go that's of those what actually things shows your commitment right i mean that's what you were saying right well I mean, if, you like, do, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to go through the filter yeah yeah if you want to go through the filter and become your future self if you want to be honest and have integrity to the goal which you yeah. say you want um I, I I heard it said recently, and I like it that if you keep if you keep engaging in those lesser goals or in that eighty percent of things that you you know the more you actually start to commit to a bigger future, the more it becomes obvious uh, the various things that are holding you back. And if you keep doing those things, not only will you have internal conflict and you'll be out of integrity with what you fully want. I, I like the analogy that you're watering the weeds. You know, you just keep whatever you water you you whatever you put energy into is going to grow, right? And, uh, and so if you keep putting energy into stuff that's ultimately holding you back, you're basically just watering the weeds. So, yeah, I think elimination is – I don't know if I'd call it – it's got to be at least 50% of the battle because that's what you're holding on to. That's what you're holding on to, and that's what – that's that's kind of your safety zone. That's your security blanket that's stopping you from just going for what you really want. Yeah. I, I, you know, as we talk about future self, we talk about getting your vivid vision of your future and what you what you want to accomplish in whatever part of your life it is, right? I mean, we right here we're talking about, you know, from a business standpoint, from being a great father, being a being a great husband, all of those different parts of life. But it can be in any anything you want to accomplish that's worthwhile, you know, that in and of itself is you know, a revolutionary side of things for a lot of people in a, in a goal setting standpoint, getting more clear. 
But I think most of us can wrap our head around that part. You know, like getting clear, okay, yes, I, I can see myself, I can kind of see what that could look like or what that could feel like, but actually executing on the side of eliminating things, that's hard, you know, that's hard uh, for a lot of people because you said it's so, it's so comfortable. And, and being able to step back enough from the view of our future self to actually see what our current self is doing that's totally out of line, um, that is really hard. And, 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 uh, and I'll tell you, that, I think that's probably one of the hardest parts for me in this process is really being critical of that 80%. You know, that 80% I shouldn't be doing, um, being really critical of that has, has, has been a challenge. I'd say the easiest way to look at it is it's 80% if it's not directly taking you to your future self, like it's 80% if it's mostly maintaining who you are now. Mm. Um, the 20%, which is the area you you go all in on, you turn the 20% into your future self's 100%, right? Like, mm. and then at some point, a big aspect of that's going to be an 80% that your future self is going to have to get rid of. But the 20% is what you what gives you so much energy and excitement and it's what it's it's where you want to go even if you're afraid of it right it's like it's what you ultimately want to be doing like when i was when i was going going to college the 20 percent for me was all around uh and i'm talking mostly in work terms right now obviously like family and faith and those things are in my 20 percent but like in terms of my work I really wanted to like grow as a writer. I wanted to like write books. That was my future self. That was my dream. Um, my 80% was like going to, going to school and like mm -hmm. trying to like pay the bills. Like those were things I felt like I needed to do. And so I'm just squeezing in my dream and barely getting 20% out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so if, if you're only spending 20% of your time on the dream and you're spending 80% of your time on call it your job, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're not going to really get there. And so the goal is, is that you start in it in the 80% is many, many things. It is also your views of the world. You know, you got to educate yourself out of certain views so that you can actually start living at higher views. I mean, it, the 80% is so many things. Um, but the goal is, is that you start spending more and more high value time where you want to focus. Uh, I really like the quote from Jim Collins where he said, if you have more than three priorities, you have none. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and, and another great book on that subject is essentialism. Just the idea of you got to define what's essential to both your current self and your future self. You got to actually know what is worth your time and what you value, because if you don't, then you're just going to be swayed by all the, the poles of the present, you know, that, and this is actually one of the biggest threats to your future self. And there's a lot of research on this. There's even a TED talk called the battle between your present and your future self. Mm. And so the great TED talk, by the way, another TED, great TED talk on the subject is called the psychology of your future self. But what all the research on this subject shows is, is that if you're not clearly connect, clear and connected emotionally to your future self, meaning you actually care about your future self enough to make investments towards them whether those are going to the gym like reading a good book and like learning a skill whatever it is if you don't care about your future self you've got no rudder like you've got no direction in the present and so there's a great quote on this it says the bigger your vision the better your decisions um there's another quote from uh, from dan sullivan he said the only way to make your present better is by making your future bigger and so um uh, yeah, yeah when, i mean i I love that quote you just shared about, you know, making your, the only way to make your present better is by making your future bigger. Um, I love how you've, you've talked about that often saying that, you know, I, I think about like uh, some of my, my back in school, you know, I think about how they used to talk about uh, when you have a process and process improvement, they would say the best way to find your bottleneck in a process is by speeding up the process, right? Almost overload the process and then you're going to find the bottleneck. So then That's you can fix awesome. the bottleneck. I love that. I love that. Right? Isn't that good? I mean, I, I, I've always loved that. So, it, so you find the bottleneck by speeding up the process. And so you, then once you find the bottleneck, you eliminate it, speed up the process again. And then you'll find the next bottleneck and you eliminate. So you know where, where to improve and to, to go. And so when I think of – I just thought of that just now that, you know, as we make our future bigger, 
we're almost starting to do that very thing. Okay, let's go from the 2X to the 10X. Let's make it even bigger. And now it's almost like, you know, we're, we're putting all that effort into it, and now we can find the bottleneck, so to speak, which I think is that 80%. So Yeah, well, the bottleneck is actually the 20%. The bottleneck is where you got to oh. focus. The bottleneck, it's, it's a different view. I, it's a different view. I, I see what you're saying. No, I like so that. So the I bottleneck like is where you got to actually put the energy and attention so that you can go 10x. Um, yeah, that's And the problem point. is is that all your energy and resources are still focused on the 80%, not enough getting to the bottleneck, right? And so mm – -hmm. Um, yeah, you're right. Because actually... if you're focusing so much on the other stuff, yeah, you're never even going to get to the point that you can have that laser focus and actually find that real. Yeah, I like that. I like it. Yeah, the bottleneck to me is it's it's your next. It's 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 the thing that's going to get you there. It's within that twenty percent, um, and so you got to really solve that at a big level. But if you're not, if you're only putting barely twenty percent of your time or energy or resources or effort into it, you're not solving the bottleneck. This is why I like uh, the whole quote, like, what's the one thing that if solved makes everything else easier or relevant? That one thing is the bottleneck, which is that 20% that you got to go all in on. And if you don't, your efforts are meaningful. Like, they're, you're, you're, you, you'll, do, you'll be spinning your wheels, focused on the 80% that's only getting you 20% of your results. You're, you know, it's, you're just you're grinding away, and you're just making marginal gains. Um so yeah, eliminating. The, so you're right, and I like I like you saying you overload, overload the system or speed up the system to identify the bottleneck. Another way of doing it is just simply making the goal so big that it filters out almost all of the current things you're doing. Because if you make a, any goal in any direction, call it spiritual, call it uh, in your work, whatever it is in a specific direction, if you make the goal really really high, what the goal is is the goal is a filter. And the higher you take the goal, the finer the filter gets, where it's like not very much can go through. So the bigger you make the goal, the more it makes obvious the things at some level are not going to be able to keep coming up. Like whether it's, you know, if you want, as an example, like let's just say the goal is like to not not, not just get in shape. Maybe it's to, to get in shape, right? Um, but then you, you elevate it to like, no, I'm going to run a marathon or no, I'm going to do an Ironman or no, I'm going to like – be the top Iron Man person in the world. Like you just keep making the goal bigger, bigger. Yeah. A lot of the bad habits start to be impossible, completely contradictory to the goal where it's like, okay, like I can't keep eating pizza four times a week. You know, like that doesn't fit the filter. And so the point of making the goal so high is, is that it, it really puts a line in the sand of like most of this, most of the, the 80 percent really obvious. Like you can't keep going at it. Like, Unless you just want to stay committed to your current self, which if if that's what you want, there's no, it's okay. Like the, the there's no one, there's no one you have to. I mean, except for yourself. And like if you're, you know, but you you don't have to account to me. You don't have to account to Clint. You know, the, and I don't have to account to Clint. Like I get to choose my life. I get to choose my standards. I get to choose my own personal integrity. Like it's between me and me. And, and it has nothing to do with anyone else. And so there is no external competition and there's no needing to like answer to anyone else. Like the only person you answer to is your, I mean, like, you know, like you have to choose who you're going to be and how you're going to live. No one else can do that. I, I love how you said that, you know, just basically that's your personal integrity, right? Is, is who do you truly want to be? And, and when you determine what that is for you, then, then you can feel at peace about that. Like you can feel great about that, and it it helps it helps helps you. You have your own filter, right, of what decisions you're going to make that are going to get you there. And and uh, and so I like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll say it in the simplest way I know is is that we all choose our priorities, and then we choose our standards within those priorities. So like I'll give my my cousin as an example. I was recently back in Utah visiting my dad. And my my cousin lives at my dad's, and he plays World of Warcraft, which is an online video game, pretty much all day, which is fine. I, I used to play World of Warcraft all day. I've got again, he chooses his priorities, but he also chooses his standards within those priorities. So he is like one of the top people in in the game. Like, and it's an online game, and he was talking. We were talking about it, and he was telling me that he left his group within the game. Since it's an online game, they call it a guild. Like it's the group you're in. He's, he's telling me about how he left his guild because it didn't meet his standards. Like he really wants 
he's he wants to be like he wants to be like you know I'll, I'll use the language like he wanted to be raiding and like getting these items and stuff like he wanted to do it at a really high level and the group he was in just wasn't up to his standards at the standard he wanted to play and so he chooses his priority in other words world of warcraft but he also chooses his standard within that and that's what we all do uh, you know, my financial advisor, as an example, like he's someone who huge priority for him is lifestyle and travel. And so there was a point when it was no longer within his standard to fly in the back of the plane. Like he elevated his standard where it's like, I'm only flying first class. Like at this point now he's like flying private half the time. And his, his standard that he's wanting to create for himself is to own his own jet. Like that's his priority and his own standards. And they have nothing to do with me and I have no judgment of him for the priorities or standards he chooses, but they may not be the priorities or standards I choose. It may not be a priority for me to have a plane, right? Or to fly first class. It may be, um, but I choose my own standards and that's ultimately what makes you who you are as a person is deciding what you prioritize and then how high or where you land your standards within those. A lot of people have the same priority. You know, they may all watch you know, like they may, they, there may be two people who play the exact same amount of golf, you know, 30 hours a week, 20 hours a week. But one of them has the standard of being a professional golfer, whereas the other one, like their standard isn't at that level. And so we all just choose what we value, what we prioritize, and where our standards are within those priorities. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, just, you know, really getting, getting clear on which part of our life, like we said, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, about work and things that way. But I think about from a family life standpoint, um, you know, I think about earlier in my career specifically, I would say things like I want to spend more time at home with my family or I want to do things like that. I want to be more present with my kids. And I found that my, my actions weren't supporting that, right? You start not having integrity with what you, what you say you want and where you want. And, and, and that's when it finally starts shifting and you actually do you know, get clear on it and shift. And, and it's, it's funny how, how, how now I feel like I've, I've done a lot better at that. And I think my past self would be very proud of where I've come at this point. But from my, but but from my current standpoint, I now in my current seat, I can see how much more I have to go, right. And how much farther I need to go. And, and I love and think, okay, I need to up it again. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things I love about future self so much is that every step we take towards our future self gives us a chance to celebrate the gains we've had, but it also gives us a new perspective to look at so that we can, once again, go and, 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 and have a different view of what our future self can be. And it starts to, starts to shift and change um, even, even a little bit more the closer we get. Um, and so and I remember when I, we first started going through once again, a lot of this in detail, uh, first this year, I remember I was going through some of this in detail with you and I was thinking, going through this and I was, I was kind of getting hung up a little bit on, we were making so much progress on things and all of a sudden I'm, I'm looking at my future self and it started shifting faster than I was thinking. And I was, I was making leaps and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my goodness, I almost felt like I was a flip flopper or something like, oh man, I, can I, can I keep committed to what I'm doing? But what I realized is, is as I took steps towards my future self, it just became, it became more and more clear. And so yeah. I love what you're saying. Um, I, I think I shared you with you this quote earlier today, but I like what Naval Ravikant said. He said, it's not 10,000 hours, it's 10,000 iterations. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, when you keep learning, you know, even in a week from now, my, mm-hmm. my future self in a week from now is going to have a slightly nuanced and better perspective than I have now. And hopefully they make an iteration. Um, yes. the opposite would be just me charting along on the path. My former self set who was radically ignorant compared to where I'm at now. But, and so you're, you're constantly tweaking, you know, and you're clarifying what clarifying what really matters and you're conti- continually, uh, adjusting your path to get to a better place. And, and so, um, the tweaking in the in the adjustments and the iterations are a sign of growing out of an old perspective. So it's it's very good, actually. You know, I, I think of in um, and I believe this is in 
the Be Your Future Self Now book. Um, like I said, I, I get them muddled together between conversations and things I read of yours. And, but I believe it talks about how, um, how I believe it was the example of uh, some of the doctors that you were saying that, that they um, had one year of experience repeated 20 times instead of 20 years experience in some study that was done, right? So and, that's like the example of focusing on 10,000 hours versus 10,000 iterations. Yes. Yes. And that's, and that's what I wanted to bring that up. It, that was a, when, I, when I first read that, I thought, man, that kind of hit me right, you know, right between the eyes a little bit. Like, w in what in my life have I accepted that mediocrity and just, just kind of kept muddling along? It's like either eliminate it or do it in a way that's worthwhile. You know what I mean? Actually get the iterations in, not just the hours. Yeah. I mean, I, this is how I look at it is your habits are your current self. And you could, you could repeat habits for decades, right? There's no mm -hmm. growth in habits. Um, it's just you doing the same thing over and over, right? Like if you want to get better at something, you actually have to like put your intentional thought toward it, right? Like habit is you on autopilot. But like if, if I actually want to get better at a skill, like it's kind of like basketball as an example. You can play basketball for 20 years and get no better. You just actually just repeating the same errors over and over again. Like to actually get better, you actually have to do what's called deliberate practice where you have specific goals and like you're actually working on a, you know, getting out of your habits and actually like actually getting better, like learning a new skill. And you're always kind of setting a new platform or a new baseline, right? And, and hopefully you just keep doing that. That's the whole continuously iterating. And so, yeah, how I look at it is, is if your weeks look very similar week to week, right, then you're just repeating the same errors over and over. You're not, you're just on autopilot. You're not actually intentionally facing your fears or facing yourself and being honest about where you're holding yourself back and making slight adjustments. You're just kind of on repeat mode. And when that's the case, you're actually just avoiding having the hard conversations with yourself. So you've got a lot a lot more internal conflict, which is going to age you a lot. It's going to age you a lot more than actually the challenge and the grit or all the things involved in learning and becoming who you want to be. It's, it's a lot more taxing to sit dormant and, and to be in internal conflict. I, I, I'm always reminded of the, the quote that you've, that you've shared many times is all progress starts by telling the truth. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning that more and more every day. Today I had to be extremely courageous and tell some truth to people that I love. And the truth can sometimes be a sword, right? It can sometimes mm -hmm. cut, it cuts through the fat, right? And it, it sometimes forces decisions, right? And mm -hmm. otherwise you can just sit and, and idle, idling, idling by and not tell the truth, but that's, that's not gonna move you forward. All progress starts by telling the truth. Yeah, oh, I love this. Well, Ben, thank you so much for being on here. I want to, I really want to, I want to, as, as we kind of come to the close here, I, I really want to ask you if you could share with us, what's, what's your top action step? We have talked a lot about a lot of great things and a lot of, a lot of things that people can do to be their future self now and, and start changing something in their life. So what, what would be your top action step for my listeners? I think the easiest way to start is you really want to think about your top three priorities. And I would actually say your only three priorities. Back to that Jim Collins quote, if you have more than three priorities, you have none. This, this requires you to actually sit because most people, their problem is, is that they have too many competing goals or desires. Um, they're too spread thin. And they're trying to do too many things, even if those too many things are all kind of just hobbies or distractions or whatnot. So you have to ask yourself, and this is kind of, it's a combination of getting connected to your future self, but also thinking about what matters most now. So it's like, just sit and ask yourself, like, if there's only three areas of your life that really matter and everything else has got to go, like, what is it? What is the three most important? And the great part is, is those priorities change over time, right? Like my past self, one of my priorities was like focus on school and get my PhD. That's not the priority of current me. That was past me priorities. My future self's gonna have different priorities. So like, you really wanna say like, what's the absolute most important thing right now for me to focus on, commit to, and invest in, in terms of my time, energy, effort, learning, 
these are the th these are the three core areas that are going to have the biggest impact on who I become in the future, and these are also relevant to what I want my life to look like in the future. Um, you just have to you have to simplify. You've all, you know simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and and once you actually start to think about, and it may take time. It takes continuous iterations, right? You may have a draft of an idea of what you think your priorities are, and then you change them with a little bit more reflection and honesty and maybe experience, but. What are the three areas right now that if you really focused on, committed to, and went deep on and started to eliminate the lesser goals, the 80% of things that's kind of pulling you away from those, and you really, you really got centered on those and set some big standards or some big targets in those areas, that's really how you start to simplify your life. And success is a lot, it's, it's a lot simpler <laughs> than mediocrity. You know, like yeah. success requires simplicity. You've got to actually choose something and focus on it and and start to let go of all the other priorities or distractions that take 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 away so i, I just say that's kind of fundamental and you just got to start there and you can think about sometimes you can reverse engineer those three priorities by simply saying where do i want my life to be in three to five years and then you can isolate you know based on where i want to be here's the priorities i'm going to have to focus on and i really i can't i can't you can't optimize 50 things. You know, you, you can only really do deep, deep, deep progress in a few areas. That's, that's the definition of going deep versus shallow. Yes. And I, and I love what was one of the things you said in the, at the beginning of all of that is you said you, you kind of prefaced by saying, hey, you've got to discover these two things. But first you said you've got to get quiet. You got to get quiet, and and I think that's one of the hardest things. I think that's one of the main reasons that that people don't get clear on these things is they don't step away from the distractions. Too much for input. Enough time. Yeah. Too much input, and so um, so I love that clarity on those on those three. It's a big thing. Ben, I mean, if you don't have those three, then there's not really any area to focus for your future self. <laughs> yeah. Where are you going to go? Yeah. What is your? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Yeah, how do you know what kind of future self you you want to be? And and how do you why know what you to do with your time? You know what I mean? How do you know what to do? How do you know where to focus if you don't know what your priorities are, what you actually care about, and what's going to matter most to your future self? Yeah, yeah, that fil the filter really is everything, right? Discovering what that filter is because it your identity yeah, it, is the filter, by the way. Yeah, ooh, I like that. Your identity is the filter through which you see the world, through which you have standards, mm -hmm. through which you choose to be committed to things. Your identity is the filter through which you see the world. And so by choosing your priorities, by getting committed to those things, and by having standards, you are actually just defining the filter for yourself. Whatever you focus on expands. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Ben, thank you. Thank Super you. Super good so to many, be with you, Clint. Super enjoyable. So many words of wisdom. I, if, if you want to connect more with Ben, there are some amazing places to do that. You can – BenjaminHardy.com, I think you said, I right? I the, the easiest is just honestly. Yeah, you can go to BenjaminHardy.com. Obviously, like, we got a stack of books. But I would just honestly say just read FutureSelf.com. I'm oh, sorry. Read Be Your Future yeah. Self now. Audiobook is there if you're an audible person. Um, yeah. Read fu Be Your Future Self now if any of this resonates. Yep. Yep. Do it. I love it. Well, Ben, thank you for being here and for, for all of you. Now is the time to be the unrivaled man in your life.